Welcome to the 2022 Equipping Conference. This is a full two-day conference, and I hope that you're not going to be overwhelmed by the material that you're about to get from Virgil and Daryl, because this is two content-rich days that are ahead of you. And I want to give a couple of just um, administrative announcements about uh, today and tomorrow. First, our first Q&A is already prepared. There should be cards on your table that if you have a question that comes up that you would like to have answered in either the question and answer that is at the end of today's sessions or at the end of tomorrow's sessions, then if you could write your question down on that and bring it at some point up to my table, which is right up front here, and uh, leave it there. We will uh, catalog them and kind of categorize them over the course of the day, and we'll bring in as many of those as we can in the Q&A sessions. And um, there's been a little bit of a change to the schedule that was posted online, just in case you're curious. Daryl asked to combine two of his sessions into one session, so he wanted to, he wanted to speak for like an hour and a half or four hours or something like that on, <laughs> on one of his topics today. So we moved things around, and uh, one of his sessions is going to be quite long, and that's the one that's right after lunch. So he has the additional challenge of trying to keep you awake after you're f- filled up. But that's on him. That was, he asked for that. That is it. I'm going to introduce now Virgil Walker, and then before Daryl's first session this morning, I'll come up and give an introduction of Daryl. Virgil Walker serves as the Executive Director of Operations for G3 Ministries, and along with Daryl Harrison, Virgil co-hosts the Just Thinking podcast, which is what Phil Johnson calls the most influential long-form Christian podcast in the world, which is substantial. And I would also add to that the, the adjective irregular meaning that they put it out when they have time. If you're list, used to listening to a podcast that comes out once a week or once a month or once a day, uh, that's not these guys. When they drop a podcast, it is loaded with content, and um, once they get done speaking on a subject, you kind of feel like there's really nothing else to say about that subject because their long-form podcast can be upwards of three hours. I think some of them have been three hours long. Virgil has completed his Master of Business Administration and is currently working on a Master of Divinity at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's been involved in jail ministry, sidewalk ministry at abortion clinics, and street evangelism. He's co-authored Why Are You Afraid and Just Thinking About the State, and then a soon-to-be-released Just Thinking About Ethnicity, which we were hoping was going to be available for this conference so we could give that away for free, but it wasn't available. Virgil and his wife, Tamika, have been married for 25 years and have three children. Virgil and Daryl have become widely known for their resolute and uncompromising confrontation of the spirit of the age and progressivism in almost every area of our culture. Uh, two years ago, when I scheduled it for Daryl to, to come up here originally, um, I knew that he was the best guy to deal with some of the issues that we're dealing with in culture, and I wasn't as aware of Vir- Virgil at the time. I just knew of Daryl. had met Daryl and Virgil at a shepherd's conference. So I scheduled this with Daryl. I kind of thought, well, two years from now, is the whole woke Christianity and the progressivism and everything is racist, is all of that really going to have blown over in our culture? Will it really be timely by the time they show up a couple years from now? And as it turns out, I think that that thread is not going away, and it is as timely now as it was two years ago when I originally planned this conference. These men have proven that they do not back down. They boldly confront the lies of our age in their podcasts, their books, their online articles, and social media posts, and they do not shy away from confronting the culture or tackling some of the most explosive subjects in the headlines. When George Floyd died, they came out within a month on a, of a podcast on that. So these guys just tackle the things that are relevant and in the news. And I hope that by the time we get done with these fine brothers this weekend, that they will serve to equip you to think biblically and respond faithfully to the, challenge that the challenges that are being presented to the church uh, by our culture. So please welcome Virgil Walker. Well, good morning. It's a joy to be with you this morning. And um, man, with an introduction like that, I feel like I just need to sit down. Um, Daryl and I are extremely honored to be here. I, I've never been to Idaho. I'm sure you're all shocked by that, right? Um, it, it is an honor to be here. I, I flew in late last night, so it was kind of one of those things where I didn't get to see the beauty of everything. Then the, then the sun kind of shows up, and I'm like, oh, there are mountains. This is a great place. We are absolutely honored to be here and uh, I look forward to what we're going to embark upon over the course of the next two days. I will tell you, it's a good thing you're at tables. Uh, it's a good thing that you have booklets that provide opportunity for notes. Because uh, if you're familiar with our podcast, you know very well that uh, we come loaded for bear. 
And uh, we come armed and equipped and we've done our research and our study and we want to give everything to you. So I promise you before the weekend is out, uh, you will indeed feel like you've been equipped to address the topics that we're intending uh, to share with you. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Jim uh, for having us, for, for calling me. I'm glad, I'm glad I got on the ticket. I mean, I'm just glad I <laughs> got to be a part. And Daryl does just a fantastic job because of who he is and where he is. There's, there are a lot of opportunities that come his way, and he never hesitates uh, to pick up the phone as my brother and say, hey, you're coming with me, uh, and here's what we're going to go do together. So I appreciate you always doing that for us. Um, I want to also, just by way of just opening up, just thank the, the elders uh, at Kootenai uh, Community Church. I know this is some work for you all to do, and, and uh, I, I, as, a, as the executive director of operations for G3, I know a little something about putting these things together uh, and what happens behind the scenes that nobody knows about, and that's how it's supposed to stay. Uh, but those who take care, who, those who, who, who do the, the work and take, takes care of those kinds of things uh, are, are the ones who are, who are really doing the, the heavy lifting. So I want to just take a moment uh, and thank you. As I learned about this conference, the equipping uh, conference, uh, I, I was, was talking with Pastor Jim about the, the, the speakers you've had in the past. You have Andrew Rappaport, you've had uh, Jason Lyle, uh, Scott Klusendorf, Paul Taylor, Phil Johnson. I have so much respect for Phil. He, is, his, he has an encyclopedic mind, um, and he's just phenomenal. So to, to hear uh, his um, encouragement, his, what he has to say about the Just Thinking podcast uh, means a tremendous amount to me. I know it does to Daryl as well. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Let me first, uh, before I do that, uh, just bring you greetings from uh, my boss, uh, Josh Bice uh, and, and G3 Ministries. If you're not familiar with G3 Ministries, shame on you. Uh, you should be. Uh, G3 is one of the largest reformed uh, conferences in the world this past uh, year, we, we hosted 6,400 people in Atlanta from uh, all over the, the country and parts around the world. Uh, we had all of the best of the best speakers, leaders, thought leaders, all were there. Of course, Daryl and I were there, so you know, it had to be something going on. <laughs> now, we were honored to be there, and, and, and Daryl and I daily kind of pinch ourselves from two guys who, who you know, were in our own little areas of the world, he in Omaha, uh, me in Omaha, him in, in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, sitting on a bed, uh, we, we talked about how we, you know, to put the podcast together. I'm literally in a closet with a microphone, right, trying to make things happen. And to go from that to where, where God has us has been absolutely breathtaking, uh, and we're incredibly humbled by it. It never, uh, it, it never gets old for us. We're always, always humbled by those kinds of opportunities. I also want to bring you greetings from my wife, Tamika, who is at home uh, there uh, with my son, uh, Price. Uh, Price just graduated from high school. I have two adult children who are in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, Princess, my daughter, who's the oldest, and Princeton, who is there uh, taking care of his sister. Uh, as we moved down to Atlanta, those two decided to stay, and, and uh, we were hopeful that they'd be able to manage themselves and take care of themselves, and they've done incredibly well, so I couldn't be more proud uh, of them as well. Pray for them. Pray for uh, our youngest, who's trying to figure out next steps uh, as, he, as he transitions from high school to, to what comes next. I think that's all of my greetings. I've got the whole thing marked out here. I, uh, I'm looking forward to what we're going to talk about today. The topic that I was given, uh, or, the, or the title of the message, is a biblical theology of man, racism, and the church. A biblical theology of man, racism, and the church. I, I want to warn you, when, when a speaker brings a bottle of water this size, <laughs> you're in for it, okay? No, truth is... I. I take some medication that dries me out sometimes, so from time to time I'll take a little sip. So you, you just, I wanted you to be aware of that. I don't normally bring that with me, but in this instance I needed to. As you can imagine with that kind of a title, the biblical theology of, of, of man, of racism, and the church. I was, I was really excited when Pastor Jim told me that my early session could be about three hours, because that's about what I need to take for, no, not three hours? Okay. Well, again, with all of that ground to cover, We've got a lot of work to do. So I'm going to ask you to roll up your sleeves, get your pen, and let's dive in. On May 15th, 2022, Rosemary Rabideau received a call from, from the principal of Kyle Middle School, where her 13-year-old son, Braden attends. Principal Mike Hendricks called to forewarn Ms. Rabideau that she would be receiving an email with allegations of sexual 
harassment, a sexual harassment charge against her son. Now, like any concerned parent, Miss Rabideau, upon hearing the term sexual harassment, her, her mind immediately went to things like rape or inappropriate touching or something of the like. Well, Miss Rabideau was shocked to learn that her son and two other boys would be charged with berating a non-binary classmate who screamed abuse at the three students. Their, 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 their crime, they used female pronouns instead of gender neutral ones. The school sees the misgendering of the student as a Title IX violation. Now, according to school officials, the administration sees using the wrong pronouns as automatically punishable speech under Title IX. Now, Rosemary, Braden's mother, said this. She said, you know, this is middle school. These, these guys are kids. They're, they're learning how to interact with one another. They've been taught all their life to see a girl and use she and her. They don't understand using plural pronouns for one student. Well, her thought process absolutely makes sense. Well, the family is, is fighting the, the long-term damaging impact of this charge against their son's reputation. They're fighting this in the courts. Now, fast forward to New York where there's a new law written governing discrimination based on gender identity and gender expression. The law, however, does more than provide equal protection for transgender individuals regarding equal employment or hiring practice, practices or housing. The, the New York City Commission on Human Rights Legal Enforcement Guidance states the following can be grounds, listen closely, the following can be grounds for legal or civil action. I'm quoting from the, the current law. Quote, number one, the intentional or repeated refusal to use a person's name pronoun or title. For example, repeatedly calling a transgender woman him or Mr. after she has made it clear that she, that she uses she and her and miss. Number two, refusal to use a person's name, pronoun, or title because they do not conform to gender stereotypes. For example, insisting upon calling a person, a non, a, a, calling a non-binary person Mr. after they've requested to be called Mix, M. X. Number three, prohibiting a person from using a particular program or facility because they do not conform to gender stereotypes. For example, a woman's shelter may not turn away a transgender woman because she looks too masculine. Oftentimes when these women enter a shelter, they're there because of, of, of the protective nature of their circumstance and at, at times to get away from a violent episode with men. Now imagine that same woman being told that there's nothing keeping a transgender woman, a biological male, from entering that space. Similarly, men cannot shelter, men, uh, men's shelters cannot, de be, uh, cannot deny service to a transgender man because she does not look masculine enough. Number four, prohibiting a transgender person from using a single gender program or facility most closely aligned to their gender identity. For example, a public university cannot prohibit a transgender man from using the men's restroom. On the other hand, a transgender woman, a biological man, can also use the same facilities where women usually house. Number five, requiring a gender non-conforming person to provide identification or proof of their gender to access the appropriate single gender uh, program or facility. Number six, barring a non-binary student from a single gender after school program out of concern that they may make other students uncomfortable. So even if you're a woman and you say, you know what, this really makes me uncomfortable, there is no protection for you in that space. Number seven, and finally, forcing a transgender, I want you to listen to all of what's being said here, all of the categories of people, of persons that we're encountering here. Number seven, forcing a transgender, non-binary, gender non-conforming or intersex person to use a single occupancy restroom instead of a shared restroom. In other words, they are required to be able to access a restroom where, the, uh, where, where, where there's a, a single gender in that particular restroom, regardless of how they self-identify. 
Now, the punishment for, for, for violating any of these codes, they will allow, the, will, will allow the New York City Commission to impose legal ramifications on the one end, but primarily civil penalties as well. And the civil pen, penalties can be anywhere from $125,000 for violations and up to $250,000 for violations resulting from the willful, wanton, or malicious conduct. While this may seem to be a step too far, this, this, when, when you look at these incidents, when you look at the situations and circumstances that are, that are coming down the pike, you begin to scratch your head like, what in the world has gone on? How did we get from there to here? The, the, this, this seems to be a step too far. Well, when you begin to wrap your mind around that, think about the fact that when you add the issue uh, from, from gender uh, and you add the intersection of ethnicity, the stakes are even higher. For example... The the now-confirmed Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson was hailed as the most highly qualified nominee for the Supreme Court in years. From the beginning of his presidency, Joe Biden made it clear that he would nominate a black woman at the first opening on the Supreme Court. Well, this was hailed by media, celebrated as a triumph. Ketanji Brown Jackson would be the first black woman to serve the court in its 232-year history. She would be only the fourth woman to do so on the high court. However, despite this, Jackson herself had a difficult time answering, if you remember, a simple question. And that question was, what is a woman? How can you define or can you define a woman? Jackson would respond by saying, I'm not a biologist. How did we get to this place? I'm old enough to remember simple truths from less than five years ago, right? That only women can get pregnant, right? That that chest feeding isn't a real thing, right? That there's no such thing as a pregnant person, right? It's a pregnant woman, not a pregnant person. Men and women have corresponding plumbing that indicates their biological identity. These are simple truths. Sex and gender are used interchangeably uh, and are not societal constructs, as some would suggest. All of these statements are, are factual statements. Everything that I've said and shared is absolutely true. The, the way we get here is because someone through the course of history began to develop the flawed idea that these notions weren't true, these presuppositions weren't true, and they began to posit their own ideas. After World War II... French feminist Simone de Beauvoir. I'm going to spell that name for you because I want you to know this person. I want you to have their information. Uh, Simone, S-I-M-O-N-E, de, D-E, Beauvoir, B-E-A-U-V-O-I-R. Let me do that one more time. Simone, S-I-M-O-N-E, D-E, and then the last name is B-E-A-U-V-O-I-R. Now, listen, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, really from Oklahoma, so I had to learn how to say Beauvoir, all right? I actually practiced that for a while just to get it correctly. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir uh, had a different idea. She wanted to uh, look at the issue of, of gender roles. And after World War II, she had a different idea about femininity and those gender roles. In her book, The Second Sex, written in 1949, Bouvard writes this, quote, science and philosophy assumed that society's prevailing opinions about men and women were grounded in sex so that, so that gender corresponded to sex, end quote. P- pretty benign statement. She's just identifying, uh, articulating the truth that we all know and hold dear, that, that forever, as far back as we know and understand, whether it was the, the issue of, of science or philosophy, sex and gender were interchangeable. However, it was Bouvard who had a different idea. While acknowledging in the quote the etymology of the word gender and that it has always been connected to sex, all of science, all of philosophy presupposed this truth. Bouvard was undeterred. She didn't care that that was true, that that was real. She had a desire to change some things. So she would be the first to introduce the ideas that would become known as gender theory, positing the idea that sex should be separate from gender. She was the first to do it in 1949 in her book. Bouvard would advance the idea that gender was something other than sex or biology. 
She distinguished gender in this way. She would say that the gender is really the, the prevailing thoughts of society. Gender is really those traditional norms that, of how we think men and women should be. And as a result, if she could reject those, she could change and transform her gender. In her mind, sex or biology was the immutable characteristics of the body that were closely linked to psychological traits. So in other words, her thought process was, my body says one thing, but my gender may be something different. And in, in, in its infancy, she would launch or lay the foundation for what would later become gender theory. Bouvard aimed to deconstruct every traditional role and societal expectation designed for women. What she wanted to change and transform were issues around marriage, what marriage looked like. She wanted to change the ideas or thought processes about the need to, to bear children at the time that she was uh, alive and, and, and doing well in the 19, late 1940s and early 1950s. The, the family structure was, was intact. The idea that, that a woman would, would find a husband, would marry, would bear children and be a home maker was very embedded, ingrained in the fabric of our culture. She had every desire to change that, to transform that, and to, and to, and to, and to, and to and thrust upon society the idea that, that these, are, I, these are things that we need to let go of, we need to walk away from, and, and she did so in her book. In her book, The Second Sex, Bouvard writes this, quote, and yet we are told that femininity is in danger. She began positing ideas that, that those who were in the know and who could see what was coming began to say, those ideas are dangerous. The, the, the idea that you're going to decouple, A, sex from gender, that's a, that's a dangerous thing you're doing. The idea that you want to throw off any constraints that marriage would provide or the protections that marriage would provide, that's dangerous. And so she responds by saying this, and yet we're told that, that femininity is in danger. We are exhorted to be women, to remain women, to become women. It would be apparent then that every female human being is not necessarily a woman. To be so considered, she must share in that mysterious and threatened reality known as femininity. Bouvard then jokingly asks the question, is the attribute of femininity something that is secreted from the, the ovaries? Is this a platonic essence, the product of a philosophic imagination? Is, 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 is a rustling of the petticoat enough to bring it down to earth? She's, she's casting off restraints. Can you, you can hear it in the language. Her desire is, is to no longer embrace the, the cultural milieu of that day regarding femininity. Here you witness Bavar's disdain for the traditional or traditional gender roles where she writes this, quote, the truth is that just as biology, biologically males and females are never victims of one another, but, hold, but, but, but both are victims of the species, so man and wife together undergo the oppression of an institution they did not create. Now, you've got to listen to what's being said in that. Let me, let me walk you back through it. She says, the truth is that just as biologically males and females are never victims of one another, but both are victims of the species. What she's denying is a sovereign God who has ordered the structure of how men and women are to interact. So we're just mammals, just trying to figure things out in the culture. We, 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 we operate no, no different than any, any monkey or ape. We're just trying to figure out what our senses are. And, and we, we're caught up in this trap called marriage. We're caught up in these, this trap of, of uh, as a woman, of femininity, of masculinity. But, but we're, we're actually victims of this idea that we didn't invent that was thrust upon us. Later, we'll unpack how it was thrust upon and, and who did the thrusting. I'll walk back through that here in a bit. If the assertion is that men oppress women, then the husband is indignant. He feels that he's the one who's being oppressed, and he is. But the fact is that it is in the masculine code. It is society who has developed the male, and in, and in his interest, he has established the woman and her situation. Again, what she's saying is that there are all these outward things. There are all these things in culture, in society, in our environment that actually craft who we are. And if that's the case, we can reject those things and recreate our own design. That's what she's saying in essence, the premise of Bavar's theories in turn or the beginning of what would usher in uh, the whole world of gender confusion. And later, it would give rise to what we're seeing now, which is transgenderism. Advancing the ideas of Simone de Beauvoir was the second wave feminist, Shulamith Firestone. I'll spell this for you. Shulamith Firestone, S-H-U-L-A-M-I. 
T-H-S-H-U-L-A-M-I-T-H. Shulamith Firestone. She would advance the, the, the cause. She was a second wave feminist. She would come after Beauvoir. And what she would do is she wrote a book uh, called The Dialectic of Sex. The Dialectic of Sex. She wrote this book in 1970. And in her book, Firestone would write this, quote, just as the end goal of the socialist revolution was not, the on, was not only the elimination of the economic class and its privilege, but the economic class distinction itself. So the end goal of the feminist revolution must be not just the elimination of male privilege, but of the sex distinction itself. Genital differences between human beings should no longer matter culturally, end quote. Again, in, in her, her writing, what she's trying to do, again, is, is cast off any restraint. She's trying to say that, that just as, as, as a socialist revolution came and, and did away with economies and broke economies down in an effort to make all of us equal and to kind of blur the lines between the haves and the have-nots so that we can all, what, all, what socialism does is it causes us to suffer equally is what it does. It's, 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 it's a flatlining of everything. There's no benefit in it. Every, everything is flatlined. All the money is taken. And when there's no money left, we all suffer equally is what, what happens in that environment. Well, she's wanting to do the exact same thing in her mind just as in, with regard to the socialist revolution, as that was a flatlining of, of economies, her thought process is we can actually, as feminists, do the same thing regarding gender. If we simply decide that we, we want to push the envelope and, and, and eliminate the, the, the sexual distinctions, we can actually be in a situation where, where human beings would no longer matter. That genital differences won't matter any longer culturally. Firestone's work would be followed by the postmodern third wave feminist, Judith Butler, Judith Butler, whose groundbreaking work advanced the cause of gender theory. She wrote a, a book in 1990. The book was called Gender Trouble, Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity. Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity. As, as, I, as I'm reading this content in preparation for our time together, I realize, especially with, with the work of, of Judith Butler, that everything she would say in her writings sounds exactly like what I'm hearing repeated today. If, if you read her works, you would think that you were watching uh, the, the latest edition of CNN or, 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 the, or the interview with, with, with Liam, the, 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 the swimmer, right? You, you would think that you were listening to that if you read the book in 1990. So, so here we are, 20 years later, parroting the ideas that came from this work. I thought, and this happened, what, five minutes ago? This gender confusion, I mean, what was this, two years ago that we're hearing this? No, these seeds have been sown. And now if you go all the way back to, to, to 1949, it's been a 70-year process to the point where we are now. We're in academia and in culture and even in our churches, we're beginning to hear conversations that mimic the writings of these, these forerunners of, the, of gender identity, of gender theory, rather. Butler writes in her book um, this. She says, quote, there's no reason to assume that gender also ought to remain as two. The presumption of a binary gender system implicitly retains the belief in a mimetic relation of gender to sex whereby gender mirrors sex unless we otherwise restrict it. She's arguing for the idea that, yeah, we, we, we can do this. We can, we, can re, we can restructure this thing. Butler continues. She says this, quote, If the immutable character of sex is contested, perhaps this construct called sex is culturally constructed as well as gender. Indeed, perhaps it is always already gender in the with the consequence that the distinction between sex and gender turns out to be no distinction at all. Now, Daryl and I read a lot of academic works. Uh, when, when, when we hit the CRT component, Daryl is going to flood you with quotes. And the reason for that is we want, we want to go back to the original source material. We never want someone to watch this on video or see it in live stream. Or, well, you didn't quote that. No, no, no. What, you heard, this, what, what I'm giving you is not my opinion. What I'm providing to you is what the actual author of the idea said in their own words. But more times than not, when we read their works, it's a bunch of gobbledygook that makes no sense. 
They're, they're, they're multisyllabic words run together in a new formation that no one's ever really heard of, but because they have the name doctor on their last name, they're able to posit it and push it out for, for, for consumption. The, I took this one quote and threw it in a, uh, in, in a Grammarly. I don't know if you guys know the software gram. You throw this in a Grammarly, all the bells and whistles go off. <laughs> They, they, they don't know what the subject is, what the verb is, what the, none of that. It absolutely makes no sense. And here's the thing. That's the point. That's the point. The point is to so confuse your mind that you're off kilter a bit while they move forward with an idea that they have in a direction that they want to go. It's never anchored in scripture. It's never anchored in, in anything historic or orthodox with regard to our faith. It's always something crazy, and this is the same here. What, what, what Butler is actually arguing in this particular uh, uh, paragraph, sentence, is she's arguing if we can say that gender is separate from sex, maybe this, maybe this sex thing is now malleable. You see how she's moving the goalpost? We, we, know that, we know that if the immutable characteristics of sex is contested, if we push back against this, perhaps this construction called sex is actually culturally construct, as culturally constructed as gender. Right? She's saying, we, 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 we already know the, the, the works of Firestone. She's already separated gender and sex. Maybe this, the issue of, of sex is something we can play around with now. We can switch the biology, is what she's saying. Recalling the works of, of others, Butler writes this, quote, if there's something right in Bouvard's claim. Now, look, she's, she's, she's in 1990. She's pointing back 40 years to Bouvard. She says, if there's something right in Bouvard's claim that one is born rather than becomes and rather but rather becomes a woman it then follows that woman itself is a term in process a becoming a constructing that cannot rightfully be said to be to, to originate or to end it's an ongoing discursive practice that is open to intervention and resignification she's trying to restructure a woman all of what she did in 1990 helps to make sense of what you saw with Katanji Brown Jackson, who is now unable to define what a woman is. Why? Well, she's imbibed the information from feminists of old. And in her mind, she can't put her finger on it. Why? Because it's ever changing. It's ever evolving. It's, it's transforming. It's shifting. Now, why all of this information with regard to a biblical theology of man? Well, because it's, it's important to understand where we currently are today and what's actually taking place today and then pull back the pages of Scripture. One last thing as I, as I kind of wrap up this section. From Bavar in 1949 to Butler in 1990, their, their ideas intersect and what they've done is they've set the framework for the gender-confused world that we're currently in. I, I want to read this to you because it was a commentator who had written on Butler's work. And, and, and he said this. He said, for Butler, gender itself is an imposition. It's an act of pseudo-violence integrated in our language and expectations. All the way down to language. This is why the, the, the gender pronouns are important. All the way down to language. It's imperative that, they, that, 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 these, that, that folks who have the, these ideas and thoughts are affirmed. Let me continue reading. There's really no real natural gender for Butler. Nor is there any natural or proper expression of sexuality. Listen closely to this. Gender and sexuality are performances arising from and constituting common life. One's identity is never fully real or fully known until and unless it is endorsed by and through public authorities and recognized by one of, the, one of uh, one's fellow citizens. That's critical. Because it's not sufficient for them to get these ideas, fill their minds with the, with the, with the logic or illogic of the, of the writers that they're, that they're reading and, and, and settle in, right? No, it's critical for their well-being that you and I affirm whatever they've decided they're going to be on a given day at a given hour. It's critical. That's why the push is on for these kinds of things to be, be pushed into law to be codified into law so that when you say something uh, that, that's not in line with how they think about themselves, you're penalized for it. That, that, that's why uh, uh, the, the example that I gave you earlier of 
of the young man who was at, uh, at school and got called out uh, uh, of school, uh, Braden. That's why Miss, Miss uh, Radenbo got the call she did. Why? Well, she's not, that student wasn't affirmed. You didn't use the proper pronoun. And in their world, that makes sense. Why? Because they're reading these kinds of things, these folks who are saying these kinds of things. I'm, hope, I'm hoping that that's helpful for you to see kind of the direction of, what, uh, of what's taking place. The truth is this. The confusion being demonstrated within these false ideologies stem from one fact. One fact that you and I, as believers in Christ, know is true. And that is this, that sinful men and women have desired to suppress the truth that they know of God in unrighteousness, Romans 1, 18 through 23. As, as Simone de Beauvoir bent the ideologies toward the, sur, toward surrounding, uh, bent the, uh, the ideological boundaries, rather, surrounding biology and gender in 1949, the writings of Judith Butler would ensure that these ideas were broken by 1990. Now, again, I share the names with you on purpose. I want you not to believe me, but go back and read these authors yourself and be equipped and knowledgeable about these issues so that when you run into this, you can say that what you're saying a is, is not new. This is a Judith Butler thing, and, and, and she was a wackadoo. I've read her book, and, and I know what you're going to say and how you're going to say it and where you're going. It's important that, you're, that you know this is, this is the equipped conference. This is where you come to get equipped. So I'm providing you some nuggets so along the way you can be equipped. Now let's open up the, the, the Word of God to see what God has to say about these issues. While all of this cultural confusion has taken place over the course of the last 70 years, one thing is absolutely true, and that is this, that, that regardless of all the confusion that's out there, God never changed his mind about what he created. As, as I'm listening to this, I, I can't help but go back to, to, to Genesis 3, that, that what these, these thought leaders are doing is, is exactly what Eve did, right? When, when the serpent shows up and, and says, did God really say? Right? That's, the, that's the whisper that you hear in what's being said. The truth of the matter is that the, the issue of identity, gender, marriage, and mankind has already been decided, and the God of the Bible has never wavered on this issue. So important is this issue that, that he puts it on the first pages of the book, you don't have to wait till 1949. You know, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Go down and look at verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1. And then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, I would love to, I would love to camp out right here uh, and, and, and for the course of the next few hours really unpack all the truth that's here. I'm not going to be able to do that. I only have two hours left. So <laughs> what I want to do is I want to hit a couple of hi highlights in this particular text, because you gotta remember, I still have to cover the ground for racism and the church. So now you kinda see I was serious about the time frame, but let me, I, I digress, let me, keep, let me keep walking. The text begins with, then God said, then God said. I, I, I've gotta stop there, like, like we've gotta stop there, like that's incredibly important, because before we can understand anything about who man is, all of theology or the study of God begins with a clear understanding of the sovereign God of the universe who has chosen to reveal himself to us through the scriptures. Now, the London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 2 on the Holy Trinity says this, the Lord our God is but one only living and true God whose subsistence is in and of himself. 
infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself. A most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach, who is immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, every way infinite, most holy, most wise, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, trans, uh, transgression, and sin. He's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him and with all most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. Wow. All, all of that, as you know, is, is from Scripture. Only thing, I, only thing I needed was some ham and bee right about there. I, you know, start, start working that out. When, when we wrap our mind, listen, our, our human mind cannot wrap itself around the glory and beauty of God. We are able, because of the word of God, to understand the nature of God on the basis of how he's revealed himself to us through the scripture. And in that alone is sufficient to worship him forever. Amen? Why would anyone want to get off of that page apart from a lack of understanding of, of, of who they are and their need for this sovereign God? That's my wife calling me, by the way, if you were wondering. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the platform. I'll be all right. Let me turn this off. All right. The attributes of God are immutable, meaning unchanging. However, as we move from what can be known about God through the scriptures, we see that God's desire is to make man his creation in his image. Let's read verse 26 again. It says, uh, let us make man, verse 26b, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So the question that we have to ask at this point is, what does it mean to be in the image of God? Have you ever thought about that? What does it mean to be an image bearer of God? That question is important. The attributes of God actually need to be placed in two main categories. One, the first one is his eternal attributes, right? This is what we understand as his omnipotence, his omniscience being everywhere present, his omnipotence being all powerful, his omniscience being all knowing, his holiness. He is the thrice holy God. He is holy, holy holy. All of these attributes are non-communicable. These are non-communicable attributes. Some, some use the term incommunicable. All that means is that these are attributes of God that cannot be given to another. Number two, the other area you have is eternal attributes. The second, second area you have is his personality attributes. Now, these are communicable attributes. These are attributes that can be passed on to man. However, one of the things that we must realize is that though these are attributes given by God to us, we can never fulfill these attributes to the degree and measure that God demonstrates in and of himself. For example, Scripture declares that our God is a thrice holy God. He is holy, holy, holy. However, scripture also commands us that we are to be holy even as our heavenly father is holy. You'll find this in Leviticus 11, 44 and 45. You'll find this in Leviticus 19, 2, Leviticus 20, 26, and then 1 Peter 1, 16. We know that God is spirit. Scripture says that God is spirit. That's John 4, 24. And we, his creatures, actually have a spirit. We know that, that God is all wisdom and all knowledge and, 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 and that all wisdom and knowledge actually comes from God. We're instructed, about that, we're instructed in James chapter 1 verse 5 that if any of us lacks wisdom, what are we to do? We're to ask of God who, who richly, generously rewards us the, 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 the wisdom that we need. God is love, and we can experience God's love and share love with others, but none of us will demonstrate the perfect love that we need to, to, to demonstrate either to God or to one another. 
This is, these are important things to understand about, about how we are indeed image bearers of God. Back in verse 26 of Genesis 1, we see that, that God gives man dominion over the creatures, over every living thing. And, and, and verse 27 reads this way. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Male and female, he created them. Well, what can we know about male and female from, from this particular Text. Well, we can know a few things. Let me walk through those and see if, if, if this bears out for what, uh, what you believe about this, this particular section of Scripture. We can know that both male and female were of equal value as created by God, right? We can know that both male and female were equally in the image and likeness of God. We can know that from this text. We can know that both male and female are equally given dominion over all that God has created, However, when we read chapter 2, which is, a, is a, an, actually a more in-depth, more expanded uh, section of Scripture to unpack what took place on the, the days, during the days of creation, when we, we read that, what we begin to see is that there is some difference, that God designed complementary roles for men and women. To Adam, he would give the work of the garden. See Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says this, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden and to work it and keep it. I love hearing those pages turn. I love pages turning. That's a good thing. God recognized that Adam needed a helper fit for him. You see that in uh, in verse 18 of, of chapter 2, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Then in verses 21 through 23, we read, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore, for this reason, in other words, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So what do we have in Scripture? God creates man and woman in his image. They are of equal value, dignity, and worth. However, they, are, they have complementary roles as the woman was actually made for the man. So if, if this is so simple, if this truth is so simple, you and I get it, it's, it's right there in the pages of Scripture. Why are people militating against this particular issue, this standard of God? We find our answer in chapter 3, right? As the serpent deceives Eve, Adam sins and the world is plunged into Chaos. Genesis 3, what else do we find? We find an essential clue that will answer what we're experiencing today. Look at verse 16 of chapter 3. God is addressing the woman, and he says, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing, and in pain shall you bring forth children, and your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. I used to think that when I saw this, your desire will be, I, I think th 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 there's another version that reads, your desire will be for your husband. I thought, oh, that means the woman is going to love, love the man, so I'm good. <laughs> She's going to desire me, right? That's a good thing. Well, the, the, the Hebrew word, and I apologize, I'll butcher this, is, is teshukah, right? Teshukah, T-S-H-U-W-Q-A-H. That's kind of phonetically how you, how you spell it out. It means in the original sense a stretching out after or a longing desire for in, a, in an effort to conquer. The same word is used in the next chapter in the story of Cain and Abel, verse, uh, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Let's take a look at that. So it came about in the course of time, I'm in verse 4, that Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought an offering from the firstborn of his flock and from their fatted portions. And the Lord regarded, had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his face was gloomy. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why is your face gloomy? If you do well, will your face not be cheerful? If you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door, and its desire is for you. But you 
must master it. The same word is used there that is used uh, for the woman in, in chapter 3, verse 16. So we all know what happened to Cain and Abel, right? Cain kills his brother Abel. Well, that same desire there as a result, because, because the desire was not conquered, it rose up in Cain to the degree that he was ready to kill his brother. That same desire is lurking in the heart of a woman. And it is imperative, it is important for her to be submitted to Christ as well as to the husband that God gives her. In the stories that I provided with you earlier, what we're witnessing is the complete deconstruction of what it means to be a man. And this is important for believers. Why? Because it is only believers who actually hold this worldview any longer. We, we, we're, we're, the, we're the ones with the lights still on here. So it's imperative that you understand what Scripture has to say because what I'm seeing, what we've been seeing as a part of the Just Thinking podcast as we read article after article after article is believers are now wavering on this issue. If I had the time, I would unpack quote after quote after quote from, from, from leader after leader after leader where they're trying to capitulate. They're, they're using terminology like toxic masculinity. Well, you know where that comes from? Judith Butler, right? They're using terminology now that comes from these books, whether they realize it, recognize it or not. They're pulling from man-made ideologies, and they're bringing that into our churches. This is why it's so important for believers to advocate for biblical masculinity. Ladies, it's important for you to, to, to share with your children these ideas, open up the scripture, and unpack the truths that are therein so that we can maintain the standard within the church. No civilization can withstand the deconstruction of its men. Believers in Christ, male and female, must be ready to embrace biblical roles designed by God for both of us. You see this now in the, in, the, in the egalitarian debate on women pastors, right? There's a rustling about this. Okay, can she preach? Should she preach? When should she preach? Should it be on Sunday morning? Can it be during the week? These are issues that all surround this, uh, this, this topic. I'd written a, um, I had a tweet that went viral about a week ago. Um, I get one for every 10 that, that Daryl does, so... <laughs> I try to match one for 10. Okay, he's got 10. I, I got to come up with something. So, bam, right? I had, a, I had a tweet. I think it said something along the lines of, if, if you have a, a, a woman as your pastor, she's not a pastor. She's a feminist who has ignored the scriptures. That was a good one, right? <laughs> it went... Haywire. Even to this day, people are, t are, are on it. Um, who was it that got on that, that tweet, brother? Uh, Andy Stanley. Famous pastor, big church. He's in, he's in Georgia. He jumps on the tweet. I, I, I will tell you, that did not work out well for him. <laughs> and I didn't say anything to him. Daryl's boss, Phil Johnson, jumped in. And Phil just, with, with, with a couple sentences, absolutely destroyed him. What he did was he posited the biblical world view. And as a result, you know, Andy Stanley actually deleted the, te the tweet and went away. Um, it, it's imperative. I, I say that in tongue-in-cheek with all seriousness. These issues are important. They matter. It's important that you're equipped to know the direction of, of culture and society and the push so that when you in your churches begin to see well-intentioned people believing that they're doing the right thing come into the doors of your church, espousing ideas, A, you know where they originate from and you know scripturally what, where to point them as a result. I could spend a whole lot more time here, but as I told you, I have two other topics to discuss, a biblical theology of race and a biblical theology of the church. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but we'll give it a shot. As most of our weekend will be uh, connected to addressing the, the subject of racism or ethnicity, uh, I won't spend a ton of time here in this section, and I will do my best to try to wrap up here in the next 15 minutes or so, 30 or so. I'm only kidding. 
Well, as we examined male and female, sex and gender, we recognize that these are not made up societal constructs. Instead, the teleology of male and female is deeply rooted in scripture. You just witnessed that as we walked through Genesis chapter one. Our our very makeup was designed in such a way for us to be male and female and to operate from a standpoint of specific gender roles. That's very clear in the scripture. So this is not a, well, I think what it means to be female is something we'll figure out in society as we go and we'll get better at it over time. That's not how that works. However, when we turn the lens to what society has determined as race or races, I would argue that this idea is indeed a social construct. Now, I won't spend a ton of time as we'll discuss it. Daryl will discuss it at great length. During our time together, you're going to hear us uh, say some things and, and repeat some things. You'll hear about the pseudoscience and craniometry of one Samuel Morton. Uh, by the end of the time, you're going, to get, you're going to hear about his scientific racism. You're going to hear about, uh, we're going to name numerous anthropologists, numerous biologists who will demonstrate the truth that we are one human race made up of many ethnicities. Of course, if we, if we had time, if, if anyone had the time to actually open up the scriptures, these kinds of things would be self-evident and wouldn't require a, a degree in, in science or biology or anthropology. You just open up the scriptures. In Acts chapter 17, turn your Bible there, we witness Paul preaching at the Areopagus. He is in Athens. The city is full of idols and his spirit is provoked within him. Paul begins preaching to a pagan culture devoid of a world view. They're they're devoid of a worldview that actually understands the origins of man, the very origins of man we we just covered. It was the the, the children of Israel who actually had the scriptures. These pagans did not have access to a knowledge of the scriptures. So they, they didn't know where things came from. So what does Paul do? He says, men of Athens in verse 22 of Acts 17. So Paul, standing in the midst of the area of Apagus, he says, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to, the, to an unknown God. What, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Verse 26 is the key. If you don't have this underlined in your Bible, you need to. If you're a, a, a listener, avid listener of the Just Thinking podcast, this should already be underlined in your Bible. Verse 26, and he, that is God, made from one man every nation of mankind. And that word nation there is the Greek word ethnos, which is where we get the term what? Ethnicity. Some of you whispered it, right? Which is where we get the term ethnicity. He made, every, he, he made from one man every ethnicity of mankind to live on the face of the earth from one Man, one race, he makes up all the ethnicities on the face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Romans chapter 5, don't turn there, write this down. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Paul explains the sinfulness of sin to believers in Rome. And as he explains the, the total depravity of man and our need for justification, he writes this in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, death through sin, and so death spread to all men, one race, one human race. Again, we have all of mankind being affected by one man. Why? Because we all came from one man. Malachi chapter 2 verse 10. Don't turn there. Write it down. We, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Scripture is clear that we, that we are all one human race. However, within culture, there's this ongoing narrative that desires to re-problematize the history of slavery, Jim Crow, and segregation. And those who promote this idea of victimization believe that America, and particularly white Americans, to be the only people on the planet to have ever been involved in the institution of slavery. However, Thomas Sowell 
economist and author, he writes this in his book. He's written this, this, uh, this quote that I'm going to provide to you. He said this in multiple ways in many books. I'm simply quoting to you from the book that he wrote called The Thomas Soul Reader. The Thomas Soul Reader, where he says this, quote, Of all the tragic facts about history, about the history of slavery, the most astonishing to an American today is that although slavery was a worldwide institution for thousands of years, nowhere in the world was slavery a controversial issue prior to the 18th century. This isn't, this wasn't, uh, slavery wasn't a controversy until the 18th century. Why? Well, because people of every race and color were enslaved and enslaved others. Everyone has been guilty of this. He said white people were still being bought and sold as slaves in the Ottoman Empire decades after American blacks were free. That's not something they talk about on CNN. However, again, this fact is lost on those who desire to maintain a victim narrative. Men like Ibram X. Kendi in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, he writes this, quote, The opposite of racist isn't a non-racist. It's an anti-racist. What's the difference? One endorses either the idea of a racial hierarchy as a racist or racial equality or as an anti-racist. Now say that ten times fast. One either believes problems to be rooted in groups of people as a racist, either you're a racist, or locates the root of the problem in power and policies as an anti-racist. So in Kindy's world, everyone is divided up as either a racist, so you're either a racist or an anti-racist, meaning that you're working and fighting to, to provide for the, the, the racial equity, not equality. And again, they use these words. You're going to hear Daryl and I unpack these. They use these words interchangeably. Equality is what we see to, to a degree in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. He made man, right? Man and woman, male and female. They were equal, right? But what he's after is equity, which is the idea of outcomes. But, but know this. They will flip those words on you. They will use equality when they actually mean outcome and use equity as a standard. So you have to listen. Is outcome attached to what's being said? And if it is, then you recognize this is, this is, this is garbage. Because everyone in this, of all the people that are in this room, none of us are, are equal. Uh, we, all don't have, we, all, we all don't have the same background. We all don't have the same uh, money in the bank. And if you have more and would like to donate to me, I'm happy to receive that. Some of us have more, some of us have less, some of, some of us are, are blessed with more melanin. Some of us are short, some of us are bald and beautiful. There's my brother in the back, the sound guy. At the same time, we are all image bearers of God. In, in that regard, we have commonality. Let me continue so that I don't press past the time. If you disagree with Kenny's position, well, he has something for you. He writes this, quote, the most threatening racist movement is not the alt-right. Unlike the drive for, for, white, uh, for a white ethno state, but the regular American, let me read that again. The most threatening racist movement is not the alt-right's unlikely drive for a white ethno state. So he's got the alt-right on one hand, and they're not the problem. But, but, but the regular American drive for a race-neutral one. So if you desire for race not to matter, remember Martin Luther King said that we, we should be judged by the content of our character, not the, not, not the, uh, the color of our skin. Well, if you believe that, well, then you're a racist. He would label King as a racist. Color, skin, that's it. You want things to be neutral? No way. We got stuff to go get. At, <laughs> at the end of the day, that, that's what it's about. Unfortunately, evangelical circles have not gone unstained by this kind of thinking. Self-professing Christians have not been immune to CRT, social justice, and intersectionality. There was a key thought leader uh, a while back uh, in the reform, in reformed circles, the B.T. Anwabwili. He was writing for the Gospel Coalition in 2019. He took issue with the fact that there were so many of us saying that, that, that there is a social justice movement and that that social justice movement is a problem. And, and here is what he wrote. He said, quote, it is my opinion uh, demonstrating that, it, in my opinion rather, demonstrating that a social justice movement exists has utterly failed. That's not surprising to me. No movement has ever existed to my knowledge 
No organization or steering committee guides anything. The various persons that are criticized as being social justicians, while at times they're my friends and my acquaintances, have not worked together to produce a joint statement to specify any goals or to take any action. All things necessary for a movement. What is he doing? It's denial. Social ju- What's wrong with you guys? You people are looking for a problem. There's no social justice movement. He said that in 2019. Fast forward a few months later, not even a full year during the, uh, the anniversary, uh, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of MLK, and see if he doesn't sound much like a social justice warrior as he writes this. He says, quote, my white neighbors and Christian brethren, well, they can start by at least saying that their parents and grandparents in this country are complicit in the murdering of a man, and he's talking about King, who only preached love and justice. Well, you're, you're guilty. You didn't, you didn't pull the trigger, you didn't, but, but you're guilty of the slaying of MLK nonetheless, or at least your grandparents and parents are. And he says, I'm, going, I'm continuing to quote from him, quote, and if we're serious, then we can go on to commit ourselves to the laying down of our lives for others as King did. What is he getting you to do? He's wanting you to be involved with the social justice movement. He's charging you with that. And if not, you're going to feel guilty. Why? Because he, he's going to pull from, from Kendi and say, well, either you're a racist or you agree with me and you're working to be an anti-racist. I could cite numerous articles and speeches where, 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 people are being, where white evangelicals are being asked to repent of whiteness, listen to voices of color, to remain silent on issues where, persons, where a person's identity in an incident is, is black, brown, or some other shade of not white. So as I close, let me say something a little bit about the church. For the sake of time, I'll condense my thoughts here. I'll simply say this, four things. One, Christ has purchased the church. Christ has redeemed the church with his blood. The church is the bride of Christ. The church belongs to Christ. And as long as Daryl and I have been doing Just Thinking, the Just Thinking podcast, we've witnessed the errors in belief of those who believe that the church is not Christ's, but it's theirs, that that the church belongs to them. And they demonstrate this when they say things like, you know, I can tell you what this church needs. And then they go on to describe some social program or a focus that has nothing to do with the scriptures or or what what the scriptures actually call the church to be. Daryl and I have witnessed this idea uh, that, that the church needs to look like you. It needs to look like you. And what is meant by that somehow is, is that every local assembly should have this multi-ethnic picture of a perfect number of white people, uh, black people, brown people sprinkled throughout the church. And, and Daryl has rightly said time and time again, and you may hear him say that this this weekend, that, that what they're after is not, is not a multi-ethnic church. What they're after is actually a multi-colored church. That's what they're thinking. Because even, even though the, the, the vast majority of you have white skin, if we took the time to walk and have conversations with you, you come from different parts of the country and the world even in, when, we, when we go back and look at your ancestry. So though a congregation may be all one shade of melanin, there may be multiple ethnicities within that congregation. But that's not what social justicians are after. You, you never hear, however... A, a black pastor, a predominantly black congregation wringing his hands in an effort to figure out how to get more white people on the platform. <laughs> they're, they're not trying to figure out, well, how, how, can we, how can we change the music and the preaching so that white folks will like it? <laughs> this charge is only leveled in one direction, and it's obvious why it's happening. It's happening because there are those who want to suppress the truth of God in Unrighteousness. There's so much more to say, but I'll leave you with a verse of scripture and then we'll close with prayer. And, and that is this. This is Christ's church. It doesn't belong to you or me. We get the benefit of being a part of it, being grafted in. And we could, we could, we could spend a whole another hour talking about the beauty of the fact that you and I have been called out, the ecclesia. We've been called out into this beautiful thing called the church. And as a result... Though I flew in last night from Atlanta, you and I are family. We are connected, not simply temporally. Do you understand that? You ain't getting rid of me. (laughs) 
we're connected eternally through Christ. And the idea that there's some programmatic approach that needs to take place in order for us to, to come together is absolutely foolish. Scripture is clear about that. In Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12, it reads this way. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you that you've made clear to us uh, your plan, your purpose in creating male and female, your purpose in developing the ethnicities and the ethnic groups and the unique beauty that that represents. We're grateful for the, the clarity of understanding that you've called us out. We're the called out ones. We are indeed your church. We're grateful for the fact that we have the opportunity to, to embrace one another as brother and sister and the Lord. We're grateful for that. I thank you that, that what these, your people heard were your words, not mine that we would be equipped to stand for truth and to defend it until you return. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you.